Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Fantasy Pros NFL Podcast. I am your host, Dan Harris. You can find me on Twitter at DanHarris80. With me, of course, is Kyle Yates. You can find him on Twitter at KyleYNFL. Yates, what's up? Not much, man. Uh, Outside of signing so many papers today and documents I closed on our new house so we uh this morning so we get to move in later on this week uh officially make the move so the signatures are all done they're all out of the way we officially ha- own the home and then now comes the fun part of actually moving so that'll suck I have to be honest it's a bold move to do all this and get a new house right as fantasy I don't know what starts. I don't know what the hell I was thinking I don't know I what mean, I I wasn't <laughs> you gotta do you gotta do what you gotta do yates so good oh, luck with word. it um i i'm sure your hand uh is a little sore from all the uh signing that you had to do during your closing but uh look i need you i need your a game today are you ready to bring it let's do it man all right so we've got a great show for you today first we're going to start by breaking down uh monday night football we had two games obviously on opening weekend then we're going to be talking about some ri- uh, rest of season risers and fallers a few buy low and sell high candidates And then we'll end on some listener mailbag questions. And to do that all with us today is Brandon Funston of The Athletic. You can find him on Twitter at Brandon Funston. Brandon, what's going on? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. It feels good to have a week in the books, huh? Yeah. uh, I mean, last night was just (laughs) weird. Uh, You know, it was a very – I'm heavily invested in James Conner. So uh, I'm a little concerned. I'm going to be honest. And I want to hear your takes on it, frankly, because – I don't know, man. There's a lot of rumblings from beat writers that even if Connor's ankle injury is as minor as it is being made out to be, this backfield may not be his own anymore. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about everything. But before we do, do you want a signed Clyde Edwards Alaire helmet and a $200 gift card to Pristine Auction and a $200 gift card to Porter Road Butcher and a package of fantasy football goods for your league's champion and your last place loser from Trophy Smack and a one month subscription? to fubo tv if you do just go to fantasypros.com slash contest fill out the form there you're just going to need to leave an honest review for the show on apple Podcasts or stitcher and submit a screenshot of that review through there fantasypros.com slash contest we are running this through september so you still have a couple of weeks if you want a bonus subscribe to our youtube channel youtube.com slash fantasy pros you'll get an extra 100 dollars credit to pristine auction which means you could have a 300 dollars credit in addition to a signed clyde edwards alaire helmet you can get one maybe two more helmets to go along with that also we do have a ton of live streams yates and i are going to be doing a live stream in a couple of hours for waiver wire over at our youtube channel so again youtube.com slash fantasy pros go ahead and subscribe and again if you're entering the contest that'll give you a little extra 100 dollars pristine credit bonus pristine auction credit bonus if you're subscribed also as i said <clears throat> yates and i are going to be doing a uh, weekly waiver wire live stream on youtube after that i'm immediately going to start writing our weekly trade chart article which you can find over at fantasypros.com. But if you want even more help with your trades, you can look at our trade analyzer over at My Playbook. It gives you instant analysis on whether a trade supports your team. It supports even uneven trades like two-for-ones or three-for-twos and even supports trading draft picks in dynasty formats. My Playbook has a ton of other tools as well. So go check out the trade analyzer and everything else over at fantasypros.com slash myplaybook, fantasypros.com slash myplaybook. All right, guys, let's get into last night. Steelers 26, Giants 16. So the James Conner thing is weird, okay? You had this vague report. I, I mean, I was watching the game. I don't know about you guys. Didn't Nothing looked apparent to me other than he didn't look good, um, but it didn't look like an injury. Then you heard this vague talk about how he was getting his ankle taped. Then there was just nothing at all. We're all sitting there waiting for a Twitter report, an announcement from the team, nothing. Finally, late in the game, he's on the sideline. He's got his helmet, then he doesn't. Late Uh, In the game, it comes out with an ankle injury. There's a report from Schefter that they're optimistic. He's not going to miss much time. Benny Snell looked pretty good. 19 carries for 113 yards. He did lose that. He didn't lose the fumble. He he fumbled, but thankfully, Juju Smith-Schuster recovered. Brandon, let me throw to you here. If Connor does have to miss, let's say, a few games at this point, how high would you rank Snell? And even if Connor is okay, does Snell factor in for the rest of the season? Um, yeah, I have some exposure to James Conner as well, so I wasn't excited about the events that transpired uh, yeah. last night. I, I think, you know, the thing with Benny Snell is he's not the receiver that James Conner is. And, you know, Mike Tomlin's history has been he likes to lean on a, a featured guy and one that has that versatile skill set. Benny Snell did look good, and he lost a lot of weight. I was, like, <laughs> doing a double take. Like, who's yeah. that guy, you know? And um, 
it, you know, I think if Mike Tomlin had his, his druthers, it would be a, a very healthy James Conner, uh, and, you know, they could use him in, in, you know, all the ways that they like to do that. But uh, this – this is supposed to be James Conner's year to prove that he can be healthy and be their running back of the future. And it's not off to a good start. So, I, you know, I, I don't have any Benny Snell. I didn't, I didn't draft James Conner and go, oh, well, I better get Benny Snell. Right. So um, I don't know. I, I, need to, I need some more information. But uh, if it's a couple weeks, then, yeah, I could see this becoming problematic where Benny Snell is getting, you know, a good, a good portion of the carries. And James Conner, who went, you know, from a guy who, I don't know, could you have – could you have imagined sixty five percent of or or more of the of the share in that backfield suddenly becomes you know he's getting fifty percent and Benny Snell's getting something close to that and they're sprinkling in Samuels and maybe Anthony McFarlane but yeah right. this is this is a bummer as a James Conner owner so let me ask you something because we did our waiver wire show yesterday and that was before Benny Snell. Uh, you know, this whole thing on Monday night. If you are making your waiver claims tonight or making fab bids, where does Snell rank in your priority list going forward? Is he up there with the Naeem Hines, Malcolm Brown, those types of guys, or is he below? Uh, he's up there with Malcolm Brown. He's not there with Josh Kelly and Naeem Hines because I just okay. think those guys' roles will be pretty solidified. I think we're still in flux with Benny Snell, and, and it's und- undefined. Um, okay. And I think that's the same thing with Malcolm Brown. Malcolm Brown looked good, looked better than Cam Akers, but do I feel like maybe Cam Akers' head was spinning and he was thinking too much and he wasn't the re- you know the Cam Akers that I liked in college? I think there's some of that, and I think they'll continue to try to get him comfortable and get him going because I think he's a more talented guy. So – I think James Conner is a more talented guy than Benny Snell, and I gotta believe if Conner's healthy, that the hierarchy will fall back into place. All right, Yates, give me your very quick breakdown here on the James Conner Benny Snell situation. If James Conner is healthy, is this his backfield? Yeah. So you mentioned it. James Conner didn't exactly look great, and the thing that we have to keep in mind is this entire Steelers offense looked rusty. Like the first half was just terrible football on either side of the ball from the offensive perspective, both the Giants and the Steelers. So. Looking at Big Ben didn't look like a he looked like a 38 year old quarterback who hadn't played football in an entire year. Right. And Deontay Johnson struggled with drops and that was concerning. And James Conner struggled with some drops out of the backfield, too. It just and wasn't getting anything done as a runner. It did not look good. And then at that point, we didn't see Conner get up to speed before he left the game. So. I think the optimism on Connor has to come crashing back down. However, if they are, if we are to trust the reports and saying that Connor, you know, his injury or his ankle injury, excuse me, isn't anything substantial, then this could be a split backfield because Benny Snell, you mentioned it, Brandon, Benny Snell looked great and he did not look anything like what the player that we saw at Kentucky or even last year, he lost a lot of weight. He was explosive, great vision between the tackles, just looked like a great runner. So this is a messy situation now, and for people who were holding out hope for James Conner to be a top 10 option at the cor- cor- or the running back position as long as he was healthy, that is all gone, I think. So as far as waiver wire priority, I would put him behind Malcolm Brown and Naheem Hines as far as what we talked about on yesterday's podcast, Dan. I would put him behind mm-hmm. there because we just don't have the clarity right now to say, is he the main guy? Is Connor going to miss six games? Is, what What's got that going to be like? If it is a split backfield, I don't think he's going to be see enough work to be a trustworthy flex option week in and week out. All right, let's talk the passing game very quickly for the Steelers. <laughs> Deontay Johnson has like a really, really, really rough first half. Uh, and then he comes back pretty strong. He sees 10 targets, six catches, 57 yards. So Brandon, encouraged, discouraged, couraged by uh, Deontay Johnson. Yeah, encouraged that he got the most targets. Uh, A little bit discouraged because I thought James Washington made some nice plays and and Chase Claypool pulling in that that catch on the sideline was fantastic, and you can see those roles uh, building going forward. I don't think this is going to be the Antonio Brown, Juju Smith-Schuster kind of thing with Deontay Johnson and Juju now. I, I, I think there's... There's going to be those other guys are going to see their roles continue to grow as well. So I like Deontay Johnson. What was he, you know, sort of mid 30s at the wide receiver position going into the year. And I don't know that I've substantially changed my value on him one way or the other. I think he's still kind of there. It's great that he was the leading target getter and he looked a lot better in the second half. Yeah, I think I'm basically keeping him where I had him coming in. That That's yeah. basically what you said. That's what it was. And yeah, I think he was mid-30s for me in my preseason ranking. So I think that's where I'd come in. Yates, you agree with that? Yeah, this was, I was terrified 
because I had been talking, <laughs> I recommended Deontay Johnson as a start everywhere. And so watching the first half, I was like, crap. I was like, he had the yips, right? Like, and this is what we saw with Dante Moncrief in week one last year. Do you remember that? Right. Like yeah. looking at Moncrief and saying he has an incredible role and opportunity in this offense. He get he got like 11 targets in that game and reeled in like two of them. Just could not catch anything. And so I was like, here we go again. If we have another Steelers wide receiver that I was hyping up that gets the yips, but he turned it around and uh, and and showed what you know the talent that I was believing in. So I mean, yeah. you mentioned like, are you discouraged, encouraged, Kurt? All of the above, right? Because <laughs> I went through a significant wave of emotions here with John, uh, Deontay Johnson. So, but I'm I'm optimistic moving forward. I think that he will be a one a one b situation here with Juju Smith Schuster. So I am still buying in on Deontay Johnson. All right. On the other side of the ball, Saquon Barkley obviously has no running room, makes up for it in the passing game with six catches for 60 yards. But the big guy was Darius Slayton, nine targets, six catches, 102 yards and two touchdowns. Golden Tate was out in this game, but obviously a tough matchup. That's a big performance here from Darius Slayton. So how do you feel about Slayton going forward here, Brandon? Uh, I, You know, I was really high on him at the beginning of the summer, and I kind of let myself just you know, fall for this Golden Tate and Sterling Shepard and all these other guys, and he's going to get squeezed. And I just, you know what? He just looked, he looked so good, and he looked so yeah. good. Like, he looked exactly like this last year, too, when he was really getting some run. And I don't know how you take a weapon like this off the field. I think uh, Darius Slayton's a guy that was a big riser for me because it just reminded me, man, he's he's different than uh, Golden Tate and Sterling Shepard, and Daniel Jones uh, is not – not afraid to take shots with him and gosh he can go up and high point a ball and and you know be the vertical guy in this offense and i think that's going to continue to be a thing and um yeah i'm 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 back in on darius slayton so all right so put a number on it or, or a ballpark number on it like rest of season at wide receiver three range higher i think i would slot him probably at this point maybe just ahead of deontay johnson so in okay. that kind of you know, mid to early wide wide receiver three range. Okay. How about you, Yates? I mean, again, Golden Tate's out here, and that was part of sort of the thinking on Evan Ingram, who obviously did not have a good game, and you were down on coming in. Yep. Um, but again, they're they're part of the reason that you were down on Evan Ingram in particular was there just are a lot of options there for Daniel Jones to throw yep. the ball to. One of those options was out to you know last night with Golden Tate. Assuming Tate's healthy next week, do you expect Darius Slayton to be the guy here for the Giants? I mean, it depends. This was the whole thing going into draft season was saying, like, it's very hard to rank one of these guys as a top 30 wide receiver because you just don't know where the targets are going to go. It probably is going to be, you know, spread out evenly across the offense. So with Golden Tate out, that was always part built into like their rankings and the difference between projections is if one of these guys misses time, then someone can absolutely assert themselves as the number one option in this offense. And Darius Slayton has done that. So when Golden Tate comes back next week, it will hurt Slayton slightly, right? Like, I'm not expecting nine targets, but he could be like this five to seven target guy. And he has the potential to take a big play to the house. And we saw that, you know, hitting that post over the top, uh, the middle of the field there with an excellent throw from Daniel Jones. So on one of his touchdowns. So I think a, t a wide receiver three moving forward, I think you can plug him in. You just might have to deal with some of these big blow up performances and then some of these games where the you know, the ball goes to Sterling Shepard or then the ball goes to Golden Tate that game, right? So that's just part of it. But I think a, a consistent wide receiver three, I'm buying in. All right, second game here, Titans 16, Broncos 14. Just kind of an ugly game. But for the mm -hmm. Titans, you know, A.J. Brown didn't get as much work maybe as you had hoped, but Corey Davis did. And once upon a time, fantasy managers were really excited about Corey Davis. Eight targets, seven catches, 101 yards. Brandon, are you buying into this with Corey Davis? If you just went and watched this game with no idea about who these guys were and no preconceived notions, you would think Corey Davis was, you know, was the man in this right. passing game. And he is talented. He's got, he, I mean, we probably dismissed him too much. I wasn't too big on the AJ, AJ Brown because, you know, it's so hyper efficient. And, you know, I, I expected a decent amount of regression from Ryan Tannehill. I thought Tannehill looked fine. I, you know, I think it's just Corey Davis, Jonu Smith. Um. Yeah, I I don't know what to make of this. I'm I was down. I'm more down on AJ Brown than most people, anyways. And this was kind of just you know visual confirmation bias here uh, a little bit. But I you know I don't think it's too damning on AJ Brown going forward. I think he's going to be fine as a wide receiver too. Um, 
But it's, I think it's more about, hey, you know what? We kind of forgot about Corey Davis. And yeah. uh, it's maybe somebody that you need to go out on the waiver wire, grab, see where this goes. But at least there's potential there for a decent amount of weekly targets. Yates, I will obviously mention that John Smith got a touchdown <laughs> so that you can take your very early victory lap. But uh, no talking about John Smith, just Corey Davis. Do you think he's a guy that fantasy managers, A, should add, and B, can ever comfortably start? Like, will he get to that range? Should you add him? Yes. However, don't overpay. I don't think that you are going to be comfortable starting him because here's an important thing to keep in mind. I went back and watched the film on this game earlier this morning because I'll be honest, guys, I fell asleep last night. It's <laughs> this worst. game started at 1030 on the, you know, in Eastern Standard Time. And I was I was out by 1130. I was You're like, not I, even in Eastern Standard. Yes, time, man. I am. Excuse <laughs> oh, me. Oh, you're back. You're I'm back in Michigan. In... I'm in oh, Michigan, my bad. Dan. I never I left. I confuse you in tags. I, I never left. You in tags. Goodness. My bad. My bad. My bad. Go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. I went back and watched the game earlier this morning. And looking at A.J. Brown, there were several moments that I was watching him and saying he has to be dealing with an injury or he has to be struggling with the altitude. He looked gassed in this game, and he did not look like his normal self. So I think there's something there that we just don't know about, or it was the altitude in Denver that he just wasn't ready, conditioned for this. I don't know what happened, but I think that eliminated him from this game and where Tannehill was looking. So... That allowed Corey Davis. And Corey Davis has always had the potential. He's always had the talent to emerge. It just hasn't happened. So I think you should add him. However, I'm not spending more than 15 to 20% of my fab on him because I don't I don't want to fully buy in because a healthy A.J. Brown and like a full strength A.J. Brown is going to be where the ball goes. Uh, same with Jonu Smith there. So that's kind of just keep that in mind. All right, let's finish up here with the Broncos. Uh, I don't think there's too much to take away here. Obviously, Cortland Sutton was out. Noah Fant looked good. He scored a touchdown. Jerry yeah, Judy had some <laughs> exciting plays, uh, mm-hmm. but had some drops, obviously. I mean, I think that maybe just kind of first game jitters. I think the big thing here is Philip Lindsay left with a foot yep. injury. I'm not sure how serious it is. And Melvin Gordon, who had lost a fumble early on, got you know the bulk of the work. Looks good, 15 for 78 and a touchdown on the ground, plus three catches for 38 yards of the air. I was a little down on Gordon coming into the year just because all the rumors of the 50-50 split. I guess the best question is, if Lindsay does need to miss time, Royce Freeman's still on the roster, obviously, and you saw him come in and get a goal line carry. Uh, where do you think Melvin Gordon, like, does he shoot up your ranks here if Lindsay is out, Brandon? Yeah, I thought he looked very much like Melvin Gordon of yesteryear. I mean, you know, different team, but he looked very much like the guy that we we know. And yeah, I think he I had him I had a hard time pushing him into my top 20 because of Philip Lindsay, because of the change of scenery. Uh, I'm definitely in the top 20 with him now. We've seen a lot of backfields kind of, you know, sort of fall apart or, or kind of change directions in week one very quickly. And I think Melvin Gordon's already positioned himself as just a rock solid guy in that backfield and probably someone who should be closer to, you know, middle of the teens at the running back position right now going forward. All right. All right. Um, Dan, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Breaking news. Alan Robinson, who is in the final year of his deal, has removed hashtag bears from his Twitter bio and deleted all bears related photos from his Instagram. (laughs) <laughs> I am I am <laughs> tilting. I am tilting real hard right now. The number of times that Yates tilts live on these oh! podcasts is really getting crazy. Okay. Well, that that's breaking news in Yates land. For now, Alan Robinson <laughs> is obviously still on the Bears and still playing, and maybe he's just mad about oh. something. But uh, everybody keep that in mind going forward. But you have lost your chance to talk about Melvin Gordon. Instead, we're moving right to the rest of the season. <laughs> risers and fallers so we're just going to be talking about look it's one week i think more than ever in a season you can get more movement from players in your rest of season rankings this year in week one because we had absolutely no preseason games it's literally kind of flying blind this is the first chance we got to see so let's start with running back here brandon give me one running back who you view as a riser rest of season after week one i think naheem hines is probably the top waiver target and his role he's He's Austin Eckler. I mean, he he really is. I mean, this is not going to go away. He might not get eight catches a game, but he's probably getting at least four every game, and he's probably catching 70-plus balls. And it's just uh, – and with Marlon Mack out there, I mean, Jonathan Taylor's not really a riser because people were drafting him like he was a man. Right. But they got bailed out. And that's uh, – so, you know, Taylor, Naheem Hines, both of those guys are, I think, soaring right now. So can we put it into just a, a, a range? Let's go half PPR. Let's split the baby a little bit. Where do sure. you think a guy like Hines would fall in your rest of season rankings in half PPR formats? 
Uh, to me, he is somewhere between James White and Austin Eckler. I think he's kind of 25-ish, late 20s at the running okay. back position in a half PPR sense. And Taylor, I think, is top 15. Okay. All right. Well, that's, I mean, Taylor for me, 100%. I think I have him 12th yeah. uh, for the rest of the season. I just think, again, if you drafted Taylor, man, I mean, you know, you expected this probably to happen, that he would eventually take over the lead back role, but... You do get bailed out a little earlier than expected. Uh, Yates, give me a rest of the season riser for you in running back. Yeah, it is going to be Malcolm Brown. Uh, it, and Taylor was Taylor and Naheem Hines were on my list as well. So Malcolm Brown is the guy, though. We talked about him on the waiver wire that he looked like the superior back in this backfield. And as long as he's healthy and running the way that he did on Sunday night, there's no way that Cam Akers is stepping forward and taking over the majority of carries. So as long as Malcolm Brown can hang on to this role, I think that he absolutely can be considered as an RB3 for your roster flex play. So uh, with, you know, the potential to score, you got the goal line carries. So Malcolm Brown absolutely moving up. I'd probably put him into this consideration of like RB32, maybe right above like Antonio Gibson still in my in my rest of season rest of season rankings. That's probably where I'd, I'd put him. Yeah, I have zero confidence in Malcolm Brown, but he's a he's a guy who shot up, obviously, my rest of season ranking just because. Do I think that Sean McVay wants him to be the lead back and get the vast majority of the touches? No, he didn't even get the vast majority of the touches in week one, but he just looked so much better than Cam Akers and obviously Daryl Henderson. Out of curiosity, Brandon, how do you feel about Malcolm Brown going forward? Um, I just, man, they, you know, they didn't have a first round pick and they went out and they used their first pick on Cam Akers. I feel like that's the guy they want. Um I, I thought a few of the rookie running backs looked like they were thinking too much and just weren't kind of ready. And, like, I, I expect Cam Akers to show better going forward as the weeks pass. So I think Malcolm Brown is going to be the guy running, you know, probably through September. At some point, though, I think there's going to be a transition. Uh, you know, and I thought it was heartening that they gave Akers 14 carries, yeah. as, as bad as he looked. Like, I wouldn't have given him nearly that much, you know, because Malcolm Brown looked a lot better. But there's, yeah. in my mind, I think Mal- uh, Cam Akers, it was just first game, kind of, you know, just everything was moving too fast in his head. Yeah, Brown's a guy who I want to add, number one, frankly, this because I, I do think, A, in the short term, I think he's earned, like, the bigger role, especially near the goal line. And I think if he can rip off, this type of performance next week, the week after, then he's got an outside shot to actually kind of dominate that backfield. And so that's worth it for me. For me, look, we talked about both those guys on the waiver wire show yesterday. So I'll do somebody who we haven't talked about. And that's James Robinson. Uh, I didn't really have James Robinson on my mind whatsoever in this fantasy season. Like, yes, obviously you had to draft him, you know, with Reckle Armstead on the COVID list and then a Zingbo out. um, But 16 carries for 62 yards, I caught his lone target for 28 yards, the only running back to receive a carry for the Jaguars, an offense that didn't look terrible necessarily. You know, obviously Minshew, I've been, I've liked, I've liked the passing game. Titans, Dolphins, Bengals, Texans, Lions, that is not the worst schedule for a running back going forward. So for me, he's a guy who was kind of an afterthought, even with the situation, even with everything coming in, was an afterthought on draft day. But he's a guy who I'm a little bit more excited about now, given how much work and the fact that he was the only one getting work going forward. Conversely, by the way, we'll, when we get to the losers, Chris Thompson is a big loser for me. I don't know if you guys are buying into what we saw against the Colts or if you think it's going to more even out and Thompson is going to be somebody who you're going to want to roster even more than Robinson necessarily. I think- Brandon, what about you? How do you feel about Robinson? Oh, I yeah. I You know, he's, he's a guy that when you put on the field, he's capable of of running the ball or catching the ball. And that was the problem with Reichwell, Armstead, and Divine Zigba. You almost needed to make one running back out of those guys and then adding Chris Thompson in. If they want to be, you know, if they want, don't want to tip their hand, then they got a guy in Robinson they can put out there. And, and you know, defenses don't know if they're running or they're going to pass. Um, yeah. So I think that plays into Robinson's favor a lot, and it hurts Chris Thompson a lot. And we saw that in week one. How about you, Yates? You were about to say something before I cut you off. Yeah, no, I was just about to say, I think we, that's an excellent point by Brandon. Uh, with Chris Thompson, the whole appeal there was looking at this offense and saying that they're probably going to be trailing in a lot of these games. And at that point, then they're playing catch up. Well, Minshew had something to say about that, and they won this game. And so that left James Robinson on the field and took Chris Thompson off of it. So I think we talked about him yesterday on, on the podcast, Dan, saying that he's someone that you can drop. I fully think that you can drop him and... Because this Jacksonville Jaguars offense looks like it's going to be more capable than we gave it credit for. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, I, I loved Minshew coming in just as a guy, especially in two quarterback leagues who I, right. I got everywhere I could. And again, as somebody who, if you waited, if you were in like a 15 team or you could get by with him, certainly. All right, Brandon, why don't you give me, do you have another uh, running back riser here? Uh, I'll throw Josh Kelly out there. Um, he's basically, you know, he's he's vying for that Melvin Gordon role, and I think he's got it. I mean, 12 carries out of the gate, and they looked good. He's different than Justin Jackson, and, I, you know, I think there's there's going to be mid-teens touches available for him going forward, and I think Anthony Lynn's going to want to run a conservative, conservative offense. And so Eckler can get his, but I think Kelly's going to get the, you know, something close to the Gordon role, probably not the full Gordon role, but, but something maybe 75% of that. Yeah, for sure. I think we talked about him yesterday, Yates, and he was the guy who we both liked coming into draft season. And yeah, he did absolutely nothing to show that he was unworthy of that role. 12 carries, 60 yards and a touchdown. And he got the goal line work and he looked spry. Yates, give me another riser if you've got one. Brandon's stealing my guys here. Uh, Josh Kelly <laughs> yeah. was the, the one that I was going to bring up. And for me, this okay. is kind of where I had him all along. I had him just in RB4 territory coming into the year because I expected him to take this role. And so I bumped him up slightly, but I think it's from like the general public perspective that he's rising. He's someone that we talked about. He, he needs to be added in your leagues and he has potential, you know, like enormous potential in this offense yeah. for him to step into this role and get the goal line carries in an offense that looks a lot different than what I thought it was going to be. So if he can get those 15 touches a game, then he's someone that can absolutely be rolled out as an RB3, RB2 in some weeks. I'm going to throw out one more guy, and he's not like a crazy rocket ship riser, but he's somebody who I thought he looked good. I expected him to get most of the work in week one. I'm not sure I expect him to look as good as he did. And that's Ronald Jones. I mean, 17 for 66 plus two catches for 16 through the air. Leonard Fournette and LaShawn McCoy combined for just seven touches for 19 yards, and they didn't look particularly great doing it. It was a tough matchup against New Orleans. And I think where you've got Ronald Jones right now, I think, you know, the plan is obviously long term. It's for Fournette. That's why they brought him in. His job is very tenuous. He misses a blitz pickup, and he's probably getting benched, you know, for somebody like that. But for now, with the way he looked, he's a guy who I was very much an afterthought for me. He's a guy who I think if you if you need somebody to start in the short term, He's a guy who I'd be willing to roll with. I don't know how you feel about that, Brandon. He's a guy who rose up my board of definitely a few spots after week one. I think that's a great call. I had the same kind of takeaway. And, you know, they didn't use Fournette a whole lot, but it looked like Ronald Jones was playing inspired like he like a guy that knows his job is on the hot seat. And, it, you know, it's I think it sparked him a little bit because yeah. he looked he looked very good in all aspects. So I'm with you. And maybe he's a Malcolm Brown type where he can at least hold down the fort for the first month of the season. And I'll again, just say they, this. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. I think you might have just been saying what I was going to say. I was just going to say they have Carolina yep. next week, yep. right? That's exactly so, what I was going to say. I mean, that's a guy where I feel like, Yates, you and I did a lot of start sit on Sunday morning, and it was constantly this guy. Or And I said, if it's a Bucks running back, the answer is almost surely the other guy. Because I just want to see what it looks like, and it was a bad matchup. But for now, yeah, I think Ronald Jones, yeah, he's going to be a guy who you can throw out there, uh, at least as a flex next week against Carolina. All right, let's do one running back faller here after week one. Brandon, why don't we start with you? Who's a running back who has fallen in your rankings after the first week? Uh, it's Mark Ingram. I Dang it, so Brandon. Much. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> me, hey, me too. All three of us. All right, it has to be. He's kind of the yeah. poster poster yep. running back for falling in week one. I mean, I thought he was a deal in the mid-20s. Like, he was, you know, I think he was seven or eight, depending on your scoring system last year at running back. And I was like, okay, you know, he didn't have a ton of touches last year, and he was so highly efficient. And even if he loses some touches, he's probably still got mid, mid-teens mid running back ranking upside. And just to, you know, 10 carries out of the gates to lose the, the goal line work to J.K. Dobbins right away, to not have any catches to the running backs. Like, I, I thought if any week Mark Ingram was going to shine, it would be week one, and it would be a while before J.K. Dobbins really kind of started threatening him a whole lot, and it just happened way faster than I expected. So he was a faller for all of us. But let me ask, how much of a faller? Because I've been trying to sort of, you know, put this into perspective, because Ingram was a guy who, I, you know, for all the reasons said, I kind of liked coming in. They were way ahead, obviously, right? So this was a right. game where you've got a 31-year-old, you know, 30, 31-year-old running back. It's not a game where you really want to waste. He didn't look good. I mean, 10 carries for 29 yards, right. but it is sort of something where you're like, why are we going to waste our bullets here in a game that we've got? So for me, he's somebody who who was my primary faller, but he didn't like fall off a cliff. I'm not ready to anoint this J.K. Dobbins or anything. I don't know about you guys, how you feel about that. If it was like, whoa, he's way, way down at this point, or just at least somebody who's clearly trending down. I'll throw it to you, Yates. Yeah, I have Ingram at RB29 
29 and I have Dobbins at RB 30 right now. So these guys are like, I'm willing to put them back to back. I was going to say this, like with the Ingram, it's kind of like that gif of Ron Swanson where Diane (laughs) and the kids come running into his office and then Andy comes in and they're all screaming and running around and they just leave. And then he like looks at the camera. He's like, what the hell just happened? Like, that's kind of what I felt with Mark Ingram was like looking at him. I'm like, all right, I got a consistent RB two for my roster. As long as you know, JK Dobbins may take over the role week eight. And then I plug him into my starting lineup and he gets what two, (laughs) three points. You know, you're just like, what the hell just happened? So I, but yeah, I'm not willing to necessarily bury him just yet. I want to see, let's get them into a matchup where they actually have to like rely on their running backs a little bit more and let's see how it plays out. Yeah, by the way, Brandon, just so you know, Yates will describe every possible situation in life with some sort of gif from Parks and Recreation. Just so you know. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. More, more Ron Swanson, the better. There is no too much. One day, next time on this podcast, I will wear my Ron Swanson Pyramid of Greatness shirt. Yes. Definitely to show off. Uh, Yates, do you have anybody else? Or is it like, no, Ingram was my guy and I'm out now. I mean, it, Ingram was definitely the clear answer here. I'll throw out Jordan Howard because Howard yes, was that someone was that... that was my number two. That's Howard correct. Was absolutely someone that I had optimism on looking at okay this is a two-person backfield it's Jordan Howard and Matt Breida and you know they're they're going to be better than they were last year it can't be worse and then Miles Gaskin out of freaking nowhere comes in and yep. takes nine carries while Jordan Howard goes eight for seven and a touchdown so like yeah it's just it was terrible I have to go back and watch the film on Howard just to see was he like struggling with an injury that I, I didn't pay attention I don't know I think he did leave there was if I remember yeah, right okay. Okay, yeah, so that gives me at least some optimism. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's at least a little bit of a relief. But uh, you can't, you can't start Howard. You cannot go. He cannot be anywhere near your starting lineup right now. No, I, we joked about it yesterday. I mean, I, I'm adding Miles Gaskin. I'm not starting him. I'm not excited about it. That was more about my lack of excitement about Adrian Peterson. But uh, Miles Gaskin is a guy who I don't know. I was not expecting this, but the two fallers there, yeah, for me, certainly Jordan Howard and Matt Breida. And to be clear, we differed a little bit coming into this. And you were higher on Jordan Howard than I was right. coming into the year. I wasn't. I didn't want a Miami running back anyway. I don't really want one now. But if there is one, I'm really not convinced it's not Miles Gaskin. Out of curiosity, Brandon, how do you view this Miami backfield now? Yeah, I'm with you on not wanting any of it. I do have some Jordan Howard here and there. Um, and, yeah, it just looks like this is still a problematic, low-efficiency low, low efficiency backfield. Um, I, I mean, I, I might add Miles Gaskin in a, in a deeper bench 12-team league or deeper yep. than that. But um, and, and I'm a Washington Huskies fan, and I like Miles Gaskin. He's just, he's just a little dude, you know, but he yeah. runs tough. And, um, you know, I think just the issue with whoever you put there is this is not a good – run blocking a good offensive running team you know and so that's just kind of the headwind that we're still dealing with yeah all right let's go to wide receivers here brandon give me a riser at wide receiver um i think it's got to be jameson crowder for me um 13 targets i think he was top five in targets in week one and i i kind of had him buried down in the you know top 40 bubble range um and i'd heard some reports that he was going to get an insane amount of targets this year and that people are sleeping on him and and i just was like it's james jameson crowder it's you know solid serviceable but i i just look at this jets offense and this jets team and it's terrible and you got brashad perryman and maybe denzel mims they're kind of two of the same they're bigger more you know vertical and sideline outside guys and jameson crowder could just continually get double digit targets week in and week out and he had to you know he kind of had to create the long touchdown but i think you know most weeks 75 yards and seven catches is going to be in play if you like jameson crowder you have come to the right podcast we were <laughs> okay. all we were all excited about him coming in i think i agree he's even risen further again be, especially because of the Le'Veon bell injury mm-hmm. right i right. mean they're they're running it i mean yep. they they are going to be behind in 100 i'm a jets fan by the way they are going to be behind in 100% of games, I would imagine, <laughs> at some point, they're going to need to throw. He's the only one who is A, healthy, and B, has chemistry with Sam Darnold at this point. So he certainly was on my list of risers. All right, Yates, who's your riser? Uh, it's got to be Paris Campbell. I mean, even looking at, we had talked about Paris Campbell as someone that you should be drafting you know, in the later rounds, and his ADP was just shocking to me. Throughout the whole offseason, tags was all about Paris Campbell. And for me, it wasn't necessarily that I was all on board with Paris Campbell as a top 35 wide receiver or anything like that, but it was more so to do with, I don't think T.Y. Hilton's going to be anything of a threat in this offense with Campbell and Pittman. So now looking at Campbell seeing nine targets out of the slot, it 
we were kind of saying like, okay, was Philip Rivers just locking onto his running backs and slot wide receivers because it was Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen? Or was it because those are the positions that he really likes to target? Well, we have our answer now. He really likes to target the slot wide receiver and the running backs. So with Naheem Hines and Paris Campbell here. So Paris Campbell now moves up into a top 40 wide receiver for me. Uh, someone that you can roll out as a wide receiver three every single week if he's seeing that target workload. Yeah, we talked about him on yesterday's show, but we talked about him before the season, that he was a guy you wanted to draft <clears> late <throat> and stash, see if things blow up. Are you as high, uh, Brandon, on Paris Campbell as we are? Yeah, I actually... I had him on my short list, but I was bringing up a risers in the in the Colts backfield. I didn't want to just be so redundant with Colts. <laughs> That's fair. But I watched, you know, I watched that game, and and Paris Campbell looked great, and he was catching those, you know, those those horizontal routes across the middle, and it just looked very natural, and it looked like something that will be repeatable over and over and over again. And with Paris Campbell, you'll get one or two, you know, jet sweeps and things like that that always, you know, it's nice little cherry on top, but just as a, just a receiver, it looked very good and looked very comfortable with Phillip Rivers right out of the gate. Yeah. All right. I'm going to name somebody who uh, we haven't really talked about because it was the opening game. So he wasn't on the waiver wire list necessarily. He was probably drafted in a lot of leagues, but I have seen him out there. Sammy Watkins. Obviously he's no stranger to big week one games, nine targets here, seven catches, 82 yards and a touchdown. He had the monstrous game in week one last year and then wasn't all that great uh, you know, for the rest of the season. But you look at the snap count for the wide receivers, Tyreek Hill, 60, Sammy Watkins, 55, then Demarcus Robinson, 33, and Michael Hardman, 19. And in the playoffs last year, right, 76 yards, 114 yards, 98 yards, 16 targets over his final two games. You know, obviously he's, at, you know, you've got, of course, Tyreek Hill, you've got Travis Kelsey, you've got Clyde Edwards-Alaire. But if you're going to give me the number two wide receiver, and I guess you can technically call him number three if you want to call Kelsey a wide receiver in this offense, and he stays healthy, this is a year where I think you're going to be able to roll out Sammy Watkins as probably, if things go well and he doesn't get hurt, a wide receiver three most weeks. Brandon, how do you feel about Watkins going forward? I feel a lot better because of you mentioned that postseason stretch. He was, uh, you know, he was a regular part of their success down the stretch, and I think that's something that when you watch what he did in Week One here, you see it's just a, you, you can kind of connect the dots as it's a continuation of him kind of settling into a comfort zone with Pat Mahomes. So yeah. uh, I'm with you. I, I, you know, I just didn't have any interest in him going into the year. You know, in any of these. I think he's absolutely rosterable and as a guy that you can have uh, as solid wide receiver depth. All right, Brandon, why don't you, do if you have another wide receiver riser, why don't you give us one more and then we'll go to Fowler? Uh, I'll, I guess Russell Gage, uh, you know, sure. 12, 12 targets. That, that cannot be ignored. You cannot ignore how bad this Atlanta defense is and how uh, Matt Ryan is, you know, when his distribution is very wide receiver heavy. It has been in recent years. So, yes, he is the third wide receiver and you'd rather have it be, you know, at least the number two wide receiver. But I think because of this defense and because – this is going to be an offense that will throw 40 plus times week in and week out. You know, Russell Gage is going to continue to get targets. Uh, and so, again, he kind of falls in that, you know, Sammy Watkins rosterable depth at wide receiver spot. Yeah, I mean, I think probably my, my guess is you're going to see Hayden Hurst get a little more involved as you get going. He had five targets in the opening week. But we said it yesterday, uh, you know, Russell Gage, since the Mohamed Sanu uh, trade, has averaged almost eight targets per Per game like that you know mm -hmm. wasn't a total fluke there i mean they all we, we joked about it you know every atlanta wide receiver on sunday had 12 targets nine catches and over 100 yards it's weird you're probably not going to see that but yeah gage is a guy who's way more involved uh than i think i thought so let's go here to fallers and yates since brandon keeps stealing everybody that you want to <laughs> talk about i'm going to start with you yates you can give me who's a wide receiver faller in your rankings yeah well i mean this guy wasn't super high to begin with we talked about him yesterday dan that's christian kirk yeah. Uh, Kirk was just someone that I was really I had him just inside my top 50 wide receivers in season long rankings. And so he's falling farther than that now in my rankings my rest of the season. This is just not a guy that I even want to roster. I don't even want to potentially hold on to him to see what the you know range of outcomes is for him. This is five targets, one reception, zero yards. When you have DeAndre Hopkins and who Kyler Murray apparently really likes to target DeAndre Hopkins. And why wouldn't you like 16 targets, 14 receptions, like good night. So I think Christian Kirk, there's just not going to be enough left over with Larry Fitzgerald on the field. Kirk has actually been very inefficient over his career. So even if he does get just a boatload of targets, which I don't see happening, it's not a guarantee that it's going to turn into consistent fantasy production. So Kirk is someone that is falling down my rankings. I'm willing to let him go to the waiver wire. 
Brandon, let me let me ask you about that because I, there, you know, we, me, and Yates and Tags were pretty divergent on how we felt about Christian Kirk coming into the season. Tags was pretty high. Yates and I were a little lower on him, but you know, it is one game. You know, if you, I feel like if you are high on him, you know, one game, a bad game. Obviously, I don't think you're necessarily going to expect the Andre Hopkins to get 16 targets every single game. Kirk did play 63 of 82 snaps, so it, it is something where I'm not sure if I rostered Kirk, which I don't anywhere. But if I did, where I'd be completely jumping shit. But how do you feel about him? Well, he was second on my uh, fallers at wide receiver, so I can't mm-hmm. do two now. Uh, but I can comment <laughs> on Kirk. It's all right, we'll I, do I, one. I, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I just thought, look, the nature of him anyways was that he was hit and miss, and I hate those kind of receivers in, in fantasy, the roller coaster ride. you get. But last year it was, what, a three-touchdown game, and he didn't score again. And, and I just see it as, okay, I don't like that that kind of nature of him in fantasy. And then you add in DeAndre Hopkins. I just think that just exacerbates the issue. There's going to be some games for Christian Kirk where he's going to show well, but it's going to probably be fewer and farther between now because DeAndre Hopkins is there and he got 16 targets out of the gate. And, and when they threw 40 times, Christian Kirk in the first game with DeAndre Hopkins gets 12 and percent target share. Just not, just not a good start to a guy who I already don't like because of the inconsistency to begin with. Yeah, I think the only thing uh, that uh, I would say is when you have a guy like this, again, I I didn't love him either. They do get Washington and Detroit and Carolina and the Jets. I mean, it's not the worst schedule. So, you know, given that they were against uh, the 49ers, maybe see how it goes with that. But again, I wasn't really rostering him. All right. You said he was number two. Who was your number one then guy to moving down? Keenan Allen. And I, I, I think Keenan Allen's great talent, but I just think he's a horrible pairing with Tyrod Taylor. And if you think about Phillip Rivers, his three-step drop, timing, you know, you know, and, and there's so much involved with that, that chemistry between those two guys. And Tyrod Taylor is not a three-step drop, run through your progressions, throw the ball. He, because of his scrambling ability, he, he will extend plays. And if you watch that game – and you didn't know anything about the past, you'd want Mike Williams because Mike Williams was targeted nine times and the guy was hurt and he was a question mark coming in. He had his hands on a lot of potential big plays. And if you're going yeah. forward, you can see that actually working out. I'm not sure I wouldn't want Mike Williams right now over Keenan Allen. I had Keenan wow. Allen down in my late 20s and I'm moving him into my 30s now. I just don't think that this is going to work out well with Tyrod Taylor. Wow. All right. That's bold. Yates, you were down, if I remember correctly, on Keenan Allen generally compared to the consensus, right? (laughs) So I was. And then with the Mike Williams news that he was going to miss all of September, that forced me to adjust my projections, which forced the ball. Because, again, looking at the Chargers depth chart, you have Jalen Guyton and KJ Hill behind Keenan Allen. So it was like Keenan Allen's just going to be targeted heavily. Well, then randomly on Saturday or even Sunday, it comes out that Mike Williams is playing. So I think if I had the ability to know that Mike Williams was going to be playing all 16 games, right? If he was going to be starting right out of the gate, then Allen would have moved back down into the same range that Brandon was talking about here, just because I didn't see the target opportunity, right? In a potentially low passing volume offense with Tyrod scrambling ability for a lot of the same reasons Brandon mentioned. I, however, did not see or forecast that Tyrod Taylor was going to lock onto Mike Williams as much as he did. So if that's the case, then yeah, I'm absolutely moving Keenan Allen down. All right, so I'll just give very quickly my wide receiver faller. It's a little lower, and it basically just means a guy who you might have been rostering, waiting to see what you had in week one. And I think now you know he's not a guy you're going to be able to get, and that's McCall Hardman for basically the same reasons that I said that I like Sammy Watkins. Again, played 19 snaps. If he's going to roster, you know, kind of rotate in here on the on the short side of it with Demarcus Robinson, it's certainly just not worth having out there. So for me, he's a guy who you can let go despite the fact that he's got obviously a ton of upside when he does get the ball in his hands. Let's move on to one QB riser each. Brandon, start with you. I'll go with the popular choice in Gardner Minshew, 19 to 20. Uh, I like the LaVisca Chenault uh, working into the mix to start. I think that's a weapon uh, that he's going to have a lot of fun with. But then, you know, DJ Shark, I just um, – yeah, I just, you know, I was a little bit hesitant on Gardner Minshew. I think people sort of inflated him a little bit because he's a fun, fun guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he actually, you know, once again comes out strong, 19 for 20, a 95%, three touchdowns. He can run, you know. Right. This this Jacksonville team actually might be a little bit better than we thought as well. So, uh, yeah, to me, he was the riser. 
Yeah, for me, it was always the rushing ability that kind of gave him this sneaky floor that nobody really thought about that much. When you have that, it's just like, man, you just got to throw a couple of touchdown passes and you expected them to play from behind. I kind of hope they will more and they were (laughs) at the beginning of this game so that Minshew can go nuts. Um, But yeah, both him and Robinson free. All right, Yates, QB riser. Cam Newton. I had Cam Newton as a top 10 option to begin with, but with his rushing ability and the way that this offense looked, I mean, guys, he's getting power QB power runs in the red zone. Like that is fantasy gold. And with the way that he was looking, he looked like he's the old Cam Newton and a guy who can absolutely, I mean, he's on pace for something like 180 rush attempts Mm -hmm. on the season. Now, is he going to get that? No, but 15 rush attempts in this game, guys, he led the entire Patriots team in rushing. The next closest was Sony Michelle with 12. So Cam Newton, man, he absolutely has the potential as long as he can stay healthy to be a top five, maybe even top three quarterback just based on his rushing ability. So this is someone that I absolutely was all in on to begin with, but I'm moving him up even further now. Man, this was the week for your season rankings. Yeah, it's every guy who you were high on yep. in your season rankings just crushed this week. <laughs> it's all going to come crashing back down. <laughs> exactly. Week, just, Don't get used how it to works. it. Man. Yeah. Don't get used to it. Uh, for me, my guy is Aaron Rodgers. Uh, you know, 32 of 44 for 364 yards with four touchdowns. Obviously was not up against a great secondary with Minnesota, but he hasn't usually done that well against Mike Zimmer's defense. He's got the soft schedule with Detroit, Atlanta, the Bucks, Houston, uh, Minnesota. So again, so and again, if Lazard and you know Marcus Valdez Scantling do step up, and he is basically somebody who just says, you know, screw this, we're not doing this conservative. You know, just lean on the run nonstop. I'm going to air it out again, show that I'm the Aaron Rodgers of old, and he's going to shoot up my rest of season rankings. He was a guy who I was like, I wouldn't mind taking a shot on if I waited a long time, but I pretty sure I either had him 12th or maybe 13th in my rest in my season long ranking. So he's a guy who I'm pretty excited about going forward. And I think it might go beyond just the soft matchup. Uh, Brandon, let's go to a QB faller for you. Who do you have? Oh, there's so many guys, so many quarterbacks. I just did not did like what I saw, but I think the, you know, the biggest name one, and the guy who does not deserve a national commercial campaign is Baker Mayfield. I don't <laughs> <laughs> um, he just looked terrible as the Ravens, but you know we kind of were talking going in that this is a make or break season for him. I almost feel like it's a make or break week for him at home against Cincinnati. Like he's gonna have yeah. to turn things around because he looks so bad in week one, and and he's looked so bad over a couple of years with flashes of some things that you start to see can say, okay, I can see why he was the number one pick, but not enough of that. And and we certainly saw none of that in week one. Just looked just looked sloppy. Yeah, that was a uh, brutal game all around for that offense. It really just did not look good for the passing game. Anyway, I mean, Odell yeah. Beckham, 10 targets, three catches. He just looked like he's ready to snap. Um, all right, Yates, how about you, QB Faller? Yeah, I love the Baker Mayfield call. I mentioned recently, like, we need to have a conversation about who's mechanics are worse at the quarterback position is it trubisky's or is it baker mayfield right, yeah, <laughs> and i think that's yeah. a closer conversation than a lot of people realize um for me it's carson wentz yeah carson wentz was someone i had a lot of optimism on this season and saying that with these weapons even though he doesn't have alshon jeffrey in the lineup even though jalen rigger might miss you know the first start of the season he's still going to have enough here with deshaun jackson with zach Ertz, with dallas goddard and based on what we saw from him last year well we found out that he apparently needs a good offensive line in front of him because he was under pressure all game long holding onto the ball way too long telegraphing his throws just did not look like the Carson Wentz that we've seen on the field so I'm hoping that this is just a rusty you know like again no preseason and I'm just hoping that Carson Wentz can turn it around and hopefully that means that he's locking on to Zach Ertz moving forward because he really didn't this game and to be able to just get the ball out quick we should see Zach Ertz heavily targeted next week but Man, I'm I'm concerned now. He's moving into this area where uh, I'm definitely concerned. Yeah, he was my faller too. Again, I, you know, I I don't I wouldn't even necessarily say that he needs a good offensive line. He just needs not what he has <laughs> right. right now playing, <laughs> right. which is just you know decrepit at this point with all the injuries. And again, Washington does the one thing about Washington's defense, you for know, sure. they have a good pass rush, right? For sure. Yep. So I, I I'm I want to see what he looks like next week. But for now, yeah, he was my guy. It was a faller. Uh, tight end riser. How about you, Brandon? I mean, I, I didn't. There weren't too many guys on my list here for this one, but I don't know if you had anybody who was rising in your rankings. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's just confirmation. I, I and you know, I don't want to throw out a, a bunch of names, but I kind of like you could throw all the kind of the buzzy guys that could be breakout guys, and they just gave you confirmation. Noah Fant, Johnny Smith, T.J. Hawkinson, mm-hmm. uh, guys that people were high on, you know, and but it was it was more 
it was more a subjective opinion than, you know, and just kind of look at the situation and say it looks really good for them. But but to have them go out and do that in week one, you know, just kind of makes you feel a lot better about kind of giving them a boost in the rankings ahead of the season. Yeah, Yates, you obviously can't move John o. Smith up anymore because no, I think he's your, no, your number one tight end going forward. But anybody, Yates, that, uh, stick out to you? Again, Not I, I agree with Brandon. I have one guy on my list, but not – not a week where you were like, ooh, baby, I'm, I'm getting right. these guys way up. No, I, I mean, again, Brandon and I must just be working off the same spreadsheet here because I've <laughs> yeah. got Noah Fant and TJ Hawkinson written down. Sure. Now, the thing to keep in mind here with Fant and Hawkinson is that they were missing two of their top targets at the wide receiver right. position on their team, yeah. right? So Cortland Sutton out for Denver and then Kenny Galladay out for Detroit. So that opens up things for these tight ends to see a little bit more you know, target share and I think that Drew Locke absolutely missed Cortland Sutton. There were some deep shots downfield that Cortland Sutton would have, you know, reeled in yesterday. So I definitely think he missed him. Noah Fant looked great, though. Same with TJ Hawkinson. That ankle that was, you know, caused me to bump him down my rankings just a little bit going into the season. That appears to be a non-issue, and he looked great against the Chicago Bears defense. So there's these guys have now inserted themselves into this backhand tight end one. If for some reason these guys are still on your waiver wire and you have, you know, uh, you lost Blake Jarwin or whatever you started Evan Ingram, who I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, then at that point, I would be perfectly willing to move over to a Noah fan or a TJ Hawkinson. Yeah, you're right. Evan Ingram is my big riser at the, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. No, I, he, he's obviously <laughs> he's my slap flop. you. <laughs> I know, he's my, you're so mean to me. Um, yeah. So if I, the, the only other riser who I would say at tight end, and again, this is way deeper. You're not starting him in any normal league. Um, but it would be OJ Howard again, for two reasons. One, he obviously out-targeted Rob Gronkowski. And number two, Rob Gronkowski looked terrible. I, he just looked old and slow and everything like <laughs> You're that. stepping on my faller. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. All right, so go ahead into Rob Gronkowski. O.J. Howard would be a guy who's rising, again, not into startable territory unless you're in a deeper league or a tight end premium league. But Howard is a guy who's rising because of somebody who may be Brandon's faller, who is? <laughs> yeah, you know, and he's not, I guess it depends on, you know, for, I think he's a faller. I was suggesting he's a faller in the eyes of other people who ranked him higher. I think I had him like 15th or 16th at tight end to start the season. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't high on him to begin with. And again, this was just confirming. He was on the field for 70, 77% of the snaps. And he got, what, right. three targets, two catches for 11 yards. And yeah. Tom Brady didn't look good. This this Tampa passing game uh, just looks out of sync. And maybe that'll take care of itself over time. But I just... Rob Gronkowski was out there a whole lot, and I just basically didn't really notice him a whole lot, other than the fact that I knew he was number 87. I kind of <laughs> search, right, searched yeah. him out, but you wouldn't have known it otherwise. As we said yesterday, looked like a guy who had taken a year off of football, for sure. Uh, Yates, the other guy on your list, of course, is? It's Evan Ingram, guys. Yes. Um, I mean, I so here's the thing. I had Evan Ingram ranked at like tight end 15 for the majority of the offseason, and then just based off of – the other guys that I had ranked in that range, you know, like a TJ Hawkinson and the concern of his ankle, Evan Ingram moved up into a top, I think he, I had him at like tight end 11 when the rankings uh, competition locked. So he was someone that I was like, yeah, he could finish in the top 12, but it speaks more to the tight end position for fantasy football rather than the actual like talent level and opportunity in this offense. Seven targets, two receptions for nine yards. No, yeah. you can't. He can't go anywhere near your starting lineup anymore. Yeah, and again, he also negated uh, a, a big pass, somebody else with an offensive pass interference, and he had dropped. It just wasn't a good day for Ingram. Um, all right, let's get here. Let's go to buy low, sell high. Who's a guy who you're looking, Brandon, to buy low on if you can early in the year? Uh, Cooper Cup, because okay. I, I kind of liked him better than the in, than the industry anyways. Uh, and, he you know, he took a big hit for – his playing time decreasing down the stretch last year and the whole talk that there'd be a lot of 12 personnel this year with Gerald Everett. Cooper Cup was out there for, I believe, 85% of the snaps Correct. in week one. And he just didn't have a, a great day. He only had like four catches. So I think the role, I mean, they just committed to him financially for the next three years. I think his role is going to continue to be up in that 80% range. I don't, Gerald Everett was was basically non-existent. So I don't know that they're going to be going 12 heavy. And I just think over the course of time, I know Jared Goff loves Cooper Cup, especially in the red zone. The guy is an absolute touchdown machine, and I think you can get him low right now, and I still have him as you know, solid wide receiver too for me. 
I think that is a great call because, again, I think that fantasy managers are going to look at his line and be like, see this? Look at this. Cooper Cup phased out. It's just like the end of last year. But no, he was in. That was the difference. He wasn't playing that many snaps towards the end of last year. But in game one, yeah, he played upwards of 80% of the snaps. So I think that's a great call by you. How about you, Yates? Who's your buy low? It's Austin Eckler, guys. There are people that are panicking over yeah. Austin Eckler, only seeing one target. However, 19 attempts on the ground. And this is someone that if you can get Austin Eckler for super cheap, I will absolutely buy him as an RB2. This is exactly what he, like, he was being drafted as an RB2, and he's putting up RB2 numbers, and now everyone's super disappointed because he didn't score. You know, so it's just one of those things, like, if you have someone in your league who is absolutely concerned about Austin Eckler, I would be putting out trade offers everywhere. And don't you think that's something that they're going back and going... Do we we scored 16 points against the Bengals. How are how are we going to fix that? Do you think right. maybe we want to get Austin Eckler the ball in the passing game because he's like you know exactly. one of the best running backs at, at doing that? And I think that was just a that was a fail on their part that I think they're going to go back to the drawing board and, and, and talk to Tyrod Taylor and they're going to figure out how to get him the ball in the passing game more. Sorry, guys. Hold on one sec. This is Brandon. Just so you know, this is the portion of my podcast where my wife comes home and opens the garage door, which is right underneath my uh, my <laughs> I office. I hear that now that you say Yeah, that. now you can hear it, right? There yep. you go. That's where it is. Sorry about that, John. I'll, I'll make a note on that. And Chris, Chris loves to leave it in anyway. Yeah, Chris he thinks just leaving it. Yep. This is it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great call. For me, again, nobody jumped out here. It, it, I've seen a couple of people panicking about DJ Moore, which I think is silly just because of the fact that he didn't have a huge week one. And obviously Robbie Anderson and Curtis Samuel saw eight targets and Robbie Anderson had the huge game and you had Christian McCaffrey had the huge game. If you can buy DJ Moore for me, you know, I get, you know, it's a new quarterback. uh, It's a new coach. It's a new offensive coordinator. People seemed concerned. I did not expect that whatsoever because I think when you're drafting a guy like DJ Moore to be a top 12 receiver, you didn't have a terrible game. You're willing to give him some rope. But if you can buy low on him, I would because I'm not at all concerned. Uh, let's go to sell high. Who do you have here, Brandon? I'll say two quick ones really quick. I think yeah. CEH, 25 carries. You can, you might be able to get like an Aaron Jones and a wide receiver two for him right now. People love him so much. Two things that concerned me, did not catch a pass, and he got went 0 for 6 on carries from three yards out. I mean, that could potentially be Daryl Williams going forward at the goal line because if you watch that, he did not push the pile at all. Part of that was up front, Kansas City's blocking, but that concerns me. I feel like I love CEH's talent, but I feel like he's a sky high. You can almost ask for anything with him right now. And then the other one's Cam Newton, who Kyle just mentioned, you know, he considers having top three to top five upside. I don't think he has any upside in the passing game. It's going to have to be all rushing. And I think this week will be very telling against the Seahawks because they got Jamal Adams, who is all over the place. And I'm curious to see how successful he is running the ball with the speed that Seattle has and Jamal Adams and even Bobby Wagner and some of their linebackers there. Because I just don't trust that passing game is going to give him a whole lot of helium. So it has to be uh, you know, an early 30s cam running the ball week in and week out. I'm a little dubious of that. All right, Yates, I know you're now on tilt because somebody spoke relatively <laughs> negatively about Cam Newton, so try to control yourself no. and give me your <laughs> No, me I'm your... just I mean, <laughs> I know this, like I am all for capitalizing on value, right? And so you really should not ever get to the point where you are so attached to these guys in fantasy football that you're not willing to sell them. So even though I have identified, you know, Johnny Smith and Cam Newton and these guys in the later rounds who can absolutely emerge, guys, Dak Prescott didn't have a great game. Okay, from from a fantasy perspective, right? He looked fine on the football field. If you can trade Cam Newton for Dak Prescott right now, I would do that. I would absolutely. That was exactly the example I was going to get. I agree. I think that's a it's a perfect challenge deal. Someone might be willing to do it. Don't do that, people. (laughs) What is wrong with you? It's one week. Please don't do that. No, I I I mean if you're if you're the new owner, please do that. But yes, right, exactly, completely. I know. I mean, this is the way that people play in your normal leagues, right? Yeah. In the leagues that people just do not consume, like the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast, right, or read everything on, or even read Brandon's work. Like these people that don't consume it as much and get the advice that we are giving, they are going to play it on a weekly basis and they're going to overreact, overreact. They 100% are. So if you can take advantage of that and say, look, Cam Newton had, you know, and you can position it. Cam Newton has top five upside. He's going to, you know, look at how many rushing attempts and look at the points, right? People are just going to look at the points and they're going to say, well, Cam Newton had more points than Dak Prescott. I'm going to make that trade. It's going to happen. All right. Well, don't do that, people. (laughs) Get a hold of yourself. Uh, Yates, give me your, though, uh, sell high. Um. 
I don't. Unless remember. you want to make it Cam Newton. Do you want to make it Cam Newton? Is that what it is? You want to jump on board? Oh no. Okay. Sorry. I had. I my brain just completely shut down. Um, my sell high. Naheem Hines. Like, if you can get Naheem Hines off your waiver wire, or let's say that you, you know, you gambled and you took Naheem Hines and put him on your the end of your bench in a, in a redraft league or anything like that. Guys, again, there are going to be people that are overreacting in week one. And if you can go out and you can trade a Naheem Hines for an Austin Eckler, like I just mentioned, a sell high and buy low candidate pairing, I guarantee that that's going to happen in some leagues. Again, it shouldn't, but throw out the offer. Get Naheem Hines on the waiver wire. If you have someone in your league who was like, oh man, I really wanted Naheem Hines, go, okay, you can have him. Give me Austin Eckler. I would do that trade 10 times out of 10. Yeah, I think this is the time that you can try to capitalize on things like this where everybody's crazy about Hines, you know, especially given week one and he got the goal line work, you know, for a while and fourth and one carries and everything like that. So, yeah, I like that idea. For me, uh, two guys that we talked about, obviously Darius Slayton, just in case, you know, I'm not not looking to unload Darius Slayton necessarily if I don't have to. But if people are going to be like, oh, this guy's a wide receiver too. Look at this. Amazing. I might. And J.K. Dobbins. Again, I have Mark Ingram as a follower. We all do. But I don't think that this is just J.K. Dobbins' backfield. And the fact people sometimes just look at box scores and they see that he scored two touchdowns. And they might be like, this is the guy I need to roster right now in Baltimore. And so I'm going to go for there. So those are my two guys. Guys, I had a bunch of listener mailbag questions. We have basically hit on almost every topic. So I'm just right. going to ask two, two real quick. Okay, let's start with you, Brandon. Uh, Joshua Kaiser asks, what are your thoughts on essentially Latavius Murray's workload? He got 15 carries. Are you concerned about the split now between Kamara and Latavius Murray? Not really. I mean, that's, this is already a lot more conservative. I think people are still stuck on this idea that this is a, you know, is a high flying offense. They're conservative now and they'll run the ball a lot. And Kamara has never been dependent on high volume and he's still getting the red zone touches. And he almost had a hat trick, just barely missed a hat trick of TDs. Yeah. And, you know, you got to remember, Kamara was also dealing with a back issue throughout preseason. So I expect his workload to go up and Murray's to maybe fall a little bit. But Murray could be a 10 to 15 touch guy week in and week out. And Kamara still can hold top five, top six value. All right, let's go to you here, Yates, for this really the last question, because all the other ones we've covered, frankly, throughout this. Uh, This is from Andrew Harbaugh. Uh, with Chubb being a pick from the previous regime, do you worry that after the uh, Browns resigned Hunt, they begin to make Hunt more of a main focus on the offense? He's particularly worried that they're going to kind of go with a little more of a hot hand approach or a 50-50 breakdown. So how do you see the Browns' backfield breaking down? Well, first off, hey, Andrew. Um, so <laughs> I think just with this one, like the situation here in Cleveland, with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, this was something that we were concerned about was that this was going to be more of a potential 50 50 split as far as the receiving workload and you know kareem hunt compensating for that i want to wait to you know issue a like final edict here on like what this backfield is going to look like i want to see him in an actual like a game that they're competitive in if that makes sense right like this game got out of hand real quick Cleveland looked terrible. Like, I expect them to go back to the drawing board. And again, Cincinnati, this is a a matchup that they're actually favored in somehow. That, you know, we were talking about that in the the company here earlier today. Like, how the heck are the Browns favored in this matchup against Cincinnati by six points? So, you know, this is just one that I want to wait and see in a game that they should win what the workload work looks like before we jump to, you know, some some massive conclusions here. All right, Brandon, real quick, how do you see, how are you evaluating this Cleveland backfield? Yeah, I think this game made a lot of sense for Kareem Hunt to get a decent amount of workload because they were trailing. And in those situations, Kareem Hunt's going to play more. Uh, I agree. I I would echo what Kyle said. I I think this week will be a lot more telling because this game should not get out of hand one way or the other. It should be fairly competitive. And if that's the case, I'm interested to see how the breakdown looks. But, uh, you know, it should if they're if they're playing a competitive game, they should be run heavy, and there should be a lot of touches available for both these guys, and they can be on the field at the same time with Kareem Hunt's, uh, you know, receiving ability. So I'm not too much down on Nick Chubb after this game. Great, I'm basically in agreement with you guys. I have very little to add as usual. Um, <laughs> all right, Brandon, thanks for coming on. It was really great talking to you. The first time we ever talked, uh, I, I thought you offered some great insights. So thanks uh, a ton for stopping by. Yeah, absolutely, guys, and uh, best of luck the rest of the way. I appreciate it. Thanks, you too. Remember, you can find Brandon over at Twitter at The Athletic and on Twitter at Brandon Funston. Don't forget to check out our trade assistant over at fantasypros.com slash myplaybook for help with your trades. We're going to be back tomorrow with another episode. We'll talk to you then. 
Thank you for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to tell us what you think in the comment section below. And while you're there, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons so you can stay up to date on all of our future content.